Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am so thrilled to, to see this large of an audience. Um, I'm very excited to be here. I want to thank Sheriff Mack for allowing me to participate in this uh, historic event. And I want to thank all of you for being here to, to help make this happen. Um, Sheriff Mack and I have been speaking at the same uh, Patriot rallies for many, many years. And we've actually uh, worked together uh, kind of co-teaching on this because our, our message is, is very much the same. Most of what you think you know about the Constitution and about our government is wrong. Um, the reason they asked me to speak first was to kind of rattle your cage a little bit, to be a little bit uh, provocative and possibly even controversial. Most of us think that we know the Constitution. I will frequently give presentations and ask the audience to raise their hand if they are good patriotic Americans. Not surprisingly, everybody in the audience raises their hand. Next question is, please raise your hand if you can tell me how many articles are in the Constitution. And sadly, very, very few people are able to do that. So let me just give you a kind of a brief introduction. When I ask people when the Declaration of Independence was signed, the most common answer that I get is 4th of July, 1776. Well, as if you've been to any subcommittee meetings, they always you know, get together and vote on the proposition. Thomas Jefferson wrote a version of the Declaration of Independence that was a thousand words longer than the uh, version that you're familiar with. He brought that draft version back to the subcommittee and after several days of modifying and deleting and you know, making changes to that document, they created the document that you and I now know as the Declaration of Independence. But it was in draft form, and they had to send that form, that draft, to a printer named Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop made 200 copies of the Declaration of Independence in typeset, basically looked like a newspaper. Eventually, they used one of those versions to create a calligraphy version of the Declaration, the Declaration of Independence that we all think we know and love. And eventually, the Founding Fathers got together on August 2nd to start signing that document. Now, anybody who's older than second grade thinks that they know how to answer this question. Who was the first president of the United States? If your answer is George Washington, then you have omitted 13 years of our history. We may not agree on which day in 1776 the Declaration was signed, but we do agree that it was 1776. If you have studied your history at all, you know that George Washington was elected to the White House in 1789, 13 years after the Declaration of Independence. How many people have heard of the Articles of Confederation? You've at least heard about it. That was the first constitution for our country. And under the Articles of Confederation, we elected a new chief executive, a new president of the United States, every single year. So the first president of the United States was Samuel Huntington. There were nine other presidents of the United States prior to George Washington. Samuel Huntington was the first president of the United States. George Washington is the first president of the United States under the Constitution. And the hopeful result of this is that if you don't know who the, when the Declaration of Independence was signed and who the first president of the United States was, then perhaps there are aspects about the Constitution and Bill of Rights that you don't know but you certainly should. So I'm going to hopefully fill in some of those blanks. The most important concept in my eight hour class is the concept of rights versus privileges. Every single one of our political problems in the United States is derived from the fact that Americans do not know accurate definitions for these two words. A right is defined by Black's Law Dictionary as a power, privilege, 
faculty or demand inherent in one person and incident upon another. One of the most important words in this statement is the word inherent, which basically is a defining characteristic. Imagine for a moment that I'm holding a brick of lead. What can you tell me about my brick of lead? Well, everybody knows that it's heavy. And unless you've taken chemistry along the way, that's about all that you know. Is it possible to put this brick of lead into a vacuum and suck all the heavy out? Can you put this brick of lead into a microwave, zap it for a couple minutes, and have it come out light and fluffy? No, those things are impossible. Heavy and lead are inseparable. You can use them interchangeably. If it is not heavy, then it's not lead. Heavy is an inherent characteristic. It is a part of the lead that can never be separated. Your rights are inherent. You can never be separated from your rights. There are other things about you which are inherent. The dreams that you had last night are inherent. You can tell us your dreams, but nobody sleeps with earplugs worried that somebody's going to come in the middle of the night and steal your dreams. They are a part of who you are. The thoughts that you are having right now are inherent. Nobody, nobody controls your thoughts except you. If I stand here and say, well, for the next 45 minutes, you are not allowed to think of a black cat. Would that edict have any authority whatsoever? Is it possible for me to prohibit you from thinking? In fact, even if you are trying to comply with my request, you have to think of a black cat first so that you can draw the circle and line through it. So your dreams are inherent. Your thoughts are inherent. And your rights are inherent. They are a part of you, and they do not come from a piece of paper. The Declaration doesn't grant you rights. The Constitution doesn't grant you rights. The Bill of Rights does not grant you any rights. If we were to burn the Constitution and shred the Bill of Rights right here in the front, how would that affect your rights? It wouldn't, not at all. It would destroy perhaps a, a relic, an important historic relic, but it would have no effect whatsoever upon your rights because those rights are inherent. A privilege is defined as a particular and peculiar benefit or advantage enjoyed by a company, a person, company, or class beyond the common advantages of other citizens. My simplified version of that is that a privilege is something that someone of a higher authority allows you to do. In other words, something that you need to get permission for. Do you need permission to think? Do you need permission to have dreams at night? If you don't need permission for those things, then why would you need permission to exercise your right? And there are only two possibilities. This is our axiom, our fundamental understanding. This is the definition of our reality, that rights and privileges are opposites. You have black and white, true and false, rights and privileges. They are not the same. They are mutually exclusive. They are opposites of each other. Either you need permission or you don't. Now, again, most Americans have difficulty with these definitions. They don't truly understand it. This is our axiom, and we have three corollaries, three things which are also true because our axiom is true. The first is that all of your rights derive from property. All of your rights. If I walk out of the back door of my house onto my land, 
I can walk back and forth, back and forth on my land all afternoon. I don't need permission. I own the land. I have a right to walk back and forth across my land. Hypothetically, if Sheriff Mack lives next door to me and on the other side of Sheriff Mack's land is Starbucks and I want to take the shortcut to Starbucks to get my morning coffee, can I walk back and forth across Sheriff Mack's land anytime I want? The answer is no. I need to get permission. I need to call Sheriff on the phone and say, Richard, I'd like to get a cup of coffee this morning. Would you mind terribly if I take the shortcut? Richard might say, oh, sure, Mike, no problem. I mean, what are friends for? So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I take the shortcut, come back to, with my Starbucks coffee. I mean, this is pursuit of happiness. And on Thursday, unknown to me, Sheriff Mack has misplaced his winning lottery ticket. Don has been upset with him for some reason. The dog bit him. He's having a bad day. I get ready to take my shortcut, and Sheriff Mack says, stop. Walk around. That's what fences are for. Can Sheriff Mack really do that? He's having a bad day, and he can deny me permission to walk across his land? The answer is yes. Sheriff Mack may have granted me the privilege on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, but at any time, for any reason, doesn't have to be a good reason, Sheriff Mack can revoke that privilege. That is the important concept here. Rights cannot be revoked. If someone gives you a privilege, they also have the power to take that privilege away from you. Now, a number of my students will say, Michael, that's a nice theory, but I have a right to life, and yet I don't own a farm. Please note that my, my statement does not say all of your rights are de derived from land. My statement is that all of your rights are derived from property. I ask you, who owns your body? I mean, most people react as if it's a nonsense question. Of course, of course I own my own body. Well, unfortunately, that's not the way this country started out. When we signed the Declaration of Independence, it said all men are created equal. Women were not allowed to vote. Women were not allowed to own property. And even more embarrassing to our American history, if you were black, you were considered property. Fortunately, we have become greatly enlightened from that point, and most people in the United States no longer hold that view. We understand that it is morally reprehensible to even assert that you own another person's body. All of our rights are derived from property. The next corollary is that every right implies a responsibility. Do I have a right to keep and bear arms? The answer is yes. But I immediately have a responsibility to make sure that nobody else gets hurt with my gun. Nobody wants their responsibilities in the United States anymore. Do a man and woman have a right to have children? Yes. Once the child is born, who's responsible for feeding the children? Who's responsible for sheltering the children? Who's responsible for teaching those children all the, uh, the skills and values they need in order to be functional adults? The answer is the parents. But in many cases, the parents abdicate that responsibility. They send their children off to government schools and we allow the government and the teachers to teach reading, writing, and arithmetic. And there are children graduating from high school who are functionally illiterate. And parents have the audacity to say, well, my children haven't learned the values I wanted them to learn. Well, that's because you abdicated the responsibility. You gave that job to somebody else, and now you're going to be upset that someone else didn't do your job well enough. The third corollary is the only limitation on your rights are, is the equal rights of others. In other words, you can do anything you want with your property. 
You have no authority, zero jurisdiction over someone else's property. One example is health care. A lot of people in the United States sincerely believe that they have a right to health care. Well, you do not have a right to immortality. None of us are going to be here 100 years from now. You do not have a right to not be sick a day in your life. I mean, part of being human and, you know, spending a weekend with a box of tissues, being sick and unable to go to work. It happens. The idea that a right to health care implies is that you can walk into a doctor's office or a hospital and the doctors and nurses would be obligated to treat you for free because you have a right <clears throat> to health care. And I said, well, if you're not willing to do your job for free, why should the doctors and nurses be obligated to do their job for free? And the usual response is, well, don't worry about it. The government is going to pay the doctor. Really? How does that go about? Well, the government comes into my apartment. They take $100 out of my wallet. They keep $50 for air conditioning, overhead, and corruption. <laughs> and they give your doctor the other $50. That sounds terribly inefficient to me, doesn't it? I mean, if you just cut out the middleman, come into my apartment and take $100 out of my wallet, you'll be able to afford twice as much health care. But I am a strong Second Amendment supporter. If you walk into my apartment and try to take $100 out of my wallet, you're going to need twice as much health care. <laughs> you have a right to your property. You do not have a right to somebody else's property, regardless how badly you want it or how strongly you feel you need it. You know, my doctor says that I've got a heart problem and I need a heart transplant. Anybody here willing to donate theirs? I mean, this is really serious. I'm going to die if I don't get this transplant. Who's going to volunteer? So it doesn't matter how bad my problem is or how sad my sob story is it still does not generate a right to have your property. These are the three most important fundamentals of my eight-hour Constitution class. Now, rights and privileges are opposites. We, the people, have individual rights. We are born with those rights. We, the people, give government privileges. We allow the government to do what it does. At least that's the way that it's supposed to be. Let's uh, look at the way things are. Okay. First of all, it says all legislative powers herein granted. If we are granting legislative powers, would these legislative powers be rights or privileges? They would have to be privileges because we the people are granting those powers. Well, if we can grant them, we can also take them away. If we gave you the authority, we can remove that authority. Those powers, those legislative powers can be revoked. Well, okay, that's a little bit of a gray area. Which legislative powers can be revoked? All legislative powers. Those of you familiar with the Declaration of Independence should be familiar with the, quote, the right of the people to alter or abolish the government, specifically a tyrannical government. And it all depends on whether we relinquish or revoke some of those privileges to alter it or revoke all of those privileges to abolish it and to start over with new guards for their future security. So we need to understand that it is the people who create the government. It is not the government who creates the people. We need to understand that proper flow of government. So what is the actual status in the United States? Well, anytime the government gives you permission, anytime they allow you to do something, they let you know by giving you a permit or a license. Permit is a verb, to suffer, allow, consent, to give, leave, or license. License is a noun, a personal privilege 
to do some particular act or series of acts on land without possessing any estate or interest therein and is ordinarily revocable at the will of the licensor. This supports my theory that if somebody gives you a privilege, they can take it away. This is fundamental. So the government will issue a concealed carry permit. They will issue a driver's license, giving us permission. How does the government give us permission? We have rights. We give the government permission. This sounds a little bit shady. Let me ask a couple philosophical questions. If you have a marriage license, what do you have permission to do now that you did not have permission to do before? Who gave you that permission? And more importantly, where did they get the authority to give you permission in the first place? Let's look at Black's Law Dictionary. A marriage license is a license or permission granted by public authority, whatever that is, to persons who intend to intermarry. What is intermarriage? Well, that's the same as miscegenation, which is defined as a mixture of the races. And it points out that this, this term used to apply to marriages between blacks and whites, people of different races. Interracial marriage used to be against the law. It used to be illegal for a white person and black person to live together and make babies. But thankfully, we, we have gotten rid of all those nasty marriage licenses for black people, haven't we? No. No, we haven't freed the blacks. What we've done is basically enslaved everybody. Why would you ask the government for permission to spend your life with somebody. The only person you need permission from is the person that you want to spend your life with. I can think of no other decision in your life which is more personal. So I'm trying to rattle your cage a little bit. I'm hoping that you will begin to think about things again and not just automatically take for granted what you thought was true. You thought that George Washington was the first president of the United States. You know, you thought that you had to have a marriage license. Perhaps not. We the people have rights. We give the government privileges. So it's, all right, well, how bad can this really get? I mean, driver's license, eh, no big deal. I mean, it doesn't really hurt you and it's for the the good of the general welfare. How many people have seen this photograph? For those of you that can't read this slide, the top it says, this is a constitution free zone. Our customs department has a 100 mile border or area within the uh, outer border of the United States, which they claim is a constitution free zone I cannot comprehend anywhere where the Constitution can be suspended. What, for political expediency? It is easy, as easy for me to understand a Constitution-free zone as it is for me to understand a four-sided triangle. It doesn't exist. This is a fallacy of somebody's mind. The Constitution that I support reaches all the way to the border. And there is no constitution-free zone, at least no legitimate constitution-free zone. So what is the solution to the problem? Well, the problem is really large, but the very first thing that we need to do is to memorize the Bill of Rights. If you become a, a soldier or a sailor, the first thing you have to do is to go through boot camp. You gotta have some really basic training if you would like to be a freedom fighter, if you would be like to be out there fighting for liberty, then basic training is to memorize the Bill of Rights. How can you defend your rights or anybody else's rights if you don't know what they are? The First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law. Wouldn't it have been nice if they just put a period there and left it? 
shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. How can they prohibit religion? In the video that you saw, it's making it illegal to have a, a Bible study group. So if I say, do not think of a black cat, is that going to be any more effective than do not think about God? How can they even contemplate prohibiting the freedom of religion? It is nonsense. Now, the most important part as of the First Amendment, as far as I'm concerned, is the freedom of speech. Why do I need freedom of speech? So I can cheer for my favorite sports teams, go Cowboys? You know, how about them Oilers? Why do I need freedom of speech? Well, if we the people have the right to alter or abolish the government, that process is going to have to start someplace. I mean, we all understand and agree that the uh, government is completely benevolent, never does anything unconstitutional, you know, but hypothetically, if they did, how would we go about changing that? Somebody somewhere is going to have to stand on a soapbox and say, hey, I think that most of what the government does is unconstitutional. And I find that unconscionable and totally unacceptable. If we can't talk about it, then we certainly cannot fix it. When I ran for President of the United States in 2004, I spoke to a college group. They had me in a beautiful auditorium with approximately 350 seats, but I hadn't become famous yet, and I had about 10 students in the front row. And about this distance, and I felt really odd talking to a small group of people that far away. So I recommended that we go to a classroom. We can be closer, it'll be a little more informal, we can see each other as we talk. And they said, no, we can't do that. I said, why? Is the classroom locked? I said, no. You are a presidential candidate. You have to be in the auditorium because the auditorium is a free speech zone. I swear, I almost fell off the stage. I said, what about the hallway? What about the rest of the campus? And the students informed me that that was a speech-free zone. I will tell you exactly what I told those students that afternoon. Anywhere I happen to be standing is a free speech zone. The government doesn't tell me what I can or cannot say, and the government doesn't tell me where I can or cannot say it. During the 2004 presidential campaign at the Republican and Democratic conventions, they had a free speech zone a mile and a half from the convention which consisted of a chain link fence topped by razor wire. That is not a free speech zone. Also very important is the petition. We have the right to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now I know it's highly unlikely that anybody working for the government would violate somebody's right. But if that ever happens, what recourse does that person have? Well, basically, according to the First Amendment, you can file a lawsuit against the government in court and win. Anybody who thinks they can win in our current court system is, I mean, let me know. I got some uh, oceanfront property in Arizona that I can let you have. But theoretically, we do have the right to alter or abolish the government, or in more civilized situations, petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now, I've been quoted many times, one of people's favorite quotes was my statement that if the First Amendment doesn't work, the Second Amendment will. The Second Amendment is also frequently misinterpreted. Most people think that a well-regulated militia means the National Guard, which is an interesting argument because the Bill of Rights was ratified in 1791. The National Guard didn't come into existence until 1903. So if well-regulated militia refers to the National Guard, 
then two things are also true. The Founding Fathers were omniscient and able to predict the future, and the Second Amendment didn't mean anything until 1903. I reject both of those hypotheses. How many people would like to live in a free state with freedom and liberty? I agree. It says a well-regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free state. Not optional, not one of those add-on you know, things. It is necessary. If you want a free country, you absolutely have to have a militia in order to keep a tyrannical government in check. The Third Amendment is probably the least known. No soldier shall, in time of peace, be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner. Once again, it demonstrates how important property ownership really is. During the American Revolution, soldiers would march into town, the captain would dismiss them, and each soldier was responsible for finding his own food and shelter. You may hear a knock on the door, says, hi, I'm sleeping in your bed, you're sleeping on the floor. And if they only took two trick chickens in the morning with them, you pretty much consider yourself lucky. But we understood that it wasn't legitimate, it was basically hypocritical to have an army protecting your life and property and then coming along and taking some of it. So the Third Amendment uh, was issued for, to uh, deal with that the modern army is so self-sufficient, um, it's unlikely that you would require this protection uh, from the government. The Fourth Amendment, I really love it when the Founding Fathers talk wishy-washy. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. What do you think they meant? It's like, well, unless it's a Thursday. I don't like the way you look. You know, you ain't from around here, are you, boy? That's not a sufficient reason. In order to have a legitimate search, you have to have a search warrant that is predicated on probable cause. You have to have some tangible evidence that suggests or leads to other evidence. And if you don't have it, then you have no authority to search. So, again, the whole purpose of the Constitution is to protect our life and our property. What is your person? It's your property. How about your house? Well, that's property. Your papers are your property. And everything else, all of your effects, are property. So the Fourth Amendment is really protecting our property, 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 property. This is really fundamental about what it's all about. When you memorize the Bill of Rights, it is the Fifth Amendment that is going to slow you down a, a little bit. 187 words, it is the longest of the Bill of Rights, and it's the one that people think that they know. If you watch Law and Order or CSI on TV, everybody knows, oh, I plead the fifth. Really? 187 words, and it boils down to, I plead the fifth. Okay? Now, that is in there, but the first thing that the, bill, uh, the Fifth Amendment does is to divide the population into military and non-military. First of all, we're talking about non-military. It says, no person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment by a grand jury. So even if somebody suspects you of murder, they can't come and put handcuffs on you unless you have presented evidence to the grand jury and the grand jury says, yeah, there's enough smoke here, maybe there's fire. Then we talk about the military except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in time of war or public danger. If you're a soldier or a sailor, we do not send you to court. We send you to a court martial, which is different. It operates under the uh, Uniform Code of Military Justice because in peacetime, we think killing people is like not a good thing. You're gonna go to jail for murder. But if you're a soldier or a sailor, I mean, part of your job 
may be to kill people. And so we have to have a different set of rules to kind of, you know, sift things out to make sure that um, you are either following orders or not. Now, the Fifth Amendment has a lot of information in it, nor shall any person, person be subject to the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb. Once you were found innocent of a crime, you cannot be convicted of that crime again. Otherwise, I could convict you over and over and over again, and you would have to go to court spending lots of money to defend yourself, and eventually you run out of money and go to jail. Nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. This is the famous I plead the fifth clause that most people think that they are familiar with. The next clause, however, is my favorite. Nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. You can't be basically thrown in jail or have your car confiscated just because, well, a police officer thought that was the way we always done it. Uh, personal experience, I was pulled over for a traffic violation. The police officer told me they were going to call a tow truck and impound my car. And I informed the officer that if he continued, he would be violating my Fifth Amendment rights, and that I would file a lawsuit against him and eventually own his house and his car. Subsequently, I decided that he was not the judge, jury, and executioner, that I could not be deprived of my car without some sort of a court process, and they returned my keys to me and let me go on my way. So I want law and order. I want peace and, and civilized action in society. But we can't just go along on that's the way we've always done it. Standard police procedure does not always conform to the Constitution. The Sixth Amendment is fairly lengthy, and it talks about the right to a speedy and public trial. Why? Why do we want the trial to be speedy? Well, let's imagine that you get arrested, we put you in the orange jumpsuit, throw you in the dungeon, and then five years later we finally collect all the evidence and bring you to court. And the witness goes, oh, that's not the guy. That's not him at all. It was somebody else. And the judge says, oh, you're free to go. What happens to that five years of your life that you just spent in the dungeon? If you are involved in a court case, you are, by definition, having your, your liberty. You're, you're occupied in your defense when you could be out sitting on a beach drinking a pina colada. And I know that it's kind of hypothetical, but you could be innocent. And the reason for having a speedy trial is that if you are innocent, we are interfering with your life as little as possible. Why is this trial supposed to be public? The trial is supposed to be public to avoid star chamber hearings. We drag somebody behind closed doors, hear all this punching, ouching, chairs breaking, tasers going off, and then the prosecutor comes out and goes, well, he was guilty, you know, now he's dead. Are we excited that we've had swift justice in the United States? It may have been quick, but I highly doubt that it was justice. The reason the trial is supposed to be public is so that all of your friends, family, and peers can keep an eye on the government to make sure that you are not thrown in jail for false evidence, as we've seen in that video early this morning. How many people are now being released from jail completely innocent, completely exonerated, because, well, this is just the easier way to go? The Seventh Amendment talks about in suits at common law. In my eight-hour Constitution class, I talk a little bit more about the difference between common law, equity law, admiralty law, which are all listed in the Constitution. Surprisingly, all of the court systems in the United States are based on statutory law, which is not even mentioned in the Constitution. And I often suggest to my students that if they'd like a little bit of entertainment, they should find a local judge or attorney and ask them for the phone number of the local common law venue. Um, I don't think that they'll be able to get an answer to that. The Eighth Amendment talks about excessive bail, excessive fines, 
and cruel and unusual punishment. Those are all wonderful words. They kind of make me feel warm and fuzzy inside. However, I never would use this myself because I don't get to decide what is excessive. The judge says, okay, we're going to give you $100,000 bail. If this is for a traffic ticket, I don't know, that sounds like it's a little excessive to me. Um, but again, it is the, the judge and the prosecutor that end up making these decisions. The Ninth and Tenth Amendments work like bookends. Basically, you do the best job you can, and then the Founding Fathers tried to close any possible loopholes. The Ninth Amendment says, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage other rights retained by the people. Does the Bill of Rights say anything about your right to have children? No, but you clearly have a right to have children. Does the Bill of Rights say anything about your right to travel? No, not a single word. Do you have a right to travel? Well, I think so. The Ninth Amendment basically says that the Bill of Rights is not a complete and comprehensive list. I could give you a thousand examples of rights that you clearly have that are never mentioned in the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights are just the ones that the Founding Fathers thought were most important. Now, the Tenth Amendment works in the opposite direction. The Ninth Amendment says, just because it's not listed, the people can still do it. The Tenth Amendment says, the powers not delegated to the United States federal government by the Constitution, nor prohibited by the Constitution to the states, are reserved respectively to the states or to the people. Now I admit, that sounds a little bit like, yes, we have no bananas. I mean, I have to stop and look at this several times before I can understand it. But ultimately, what it establishes is that we, the people, are the source of all political power in the United States. We, the people, invented the state governments and vested them with limited power. The state governments then got together and created the federal government and gave a percentage of their power and vested it into the federal government. So on this scale, we, the people, are on top. The state governments are there to defend us against the federal government, and the federal government is small, tiny, and at the bottom of the pyramid. As James Madison says, its powers are um, few and well-defined. I, I challenge you to find an aspect of your life that the federal government does not think it has the authority to control. One of the things that the federal government is doing right now is trying to put Amish farmers out of business for selling raw milk. We're not talking marijuana, cocaine, heroin. This is milk. You know the white stuff that comes out of a cow? And the government is telling you you can't drink it unless it's been processed by the government? Don't think of a black cat. Well, telling me not to drink raw milk is going to have just about as much effect. I own my body. I decide what food I eat. I decide what liquids I drink. And I decide whether or not I am going to defend my individual rights. This is absolutely fundamental. The only legitimate purpose of any government at the county, state, or federal level is to protect the life, liberty, and private property of the citizens. If that government is doing anything else, it is illegitimate. Again, I want to thank you for being here. I do teach an eight-hour class. I um, invite you to contact me. I am happy to light the fires of liberty in your county or your area. Um, as long as I am capable of taking a breath, I will be working to restore our constitutional republic. Uh, again, I want to thank Sheriff Mack for giving me the honor to be here and participate with you. I will be here all weekend. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to contact me. Thank you so much for your attention.